recorded in the minutes as loud and stormy applause. Uh, it's fantastic to have you here to celebrate the 106th anniversary of the great Soviet, well, socialist even, October Revolution. So, Christina from Italy, Christina, who unfortunately is unwell and not with us today. So um, I hope you'll forgive me uh, if any, there's any lapse in the protocol. That's probably the reason. But I'm going to invite comrades up to the stage. We have a fantastic platform. Uh, and without much further ado, I'm going to begin. So if I could ask, first of all, please, Ambassador Rocio del Valle, Maniero. <laughs> You're laughing at my pronunciation. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, the ambassador of Venezuela to come to the stage and please give her a big round of applause for especially especially for letting us use the premises uh, and we are in her house today so we can ask her to say very quickly a word of greeting. Yeah, okay. 
Через несколько недель, буквально скоро, мы будем отмечать 106-ю годовщину со дня свершения Великой Октябрьской социалистической революции. Это день, праздник для всех трудящихся всего мира. Это э, в 1917 году тогда пролетариат России показал путь, по которому должно пойти все человечество. По этому пути... Этой, этому пути сейчас, по этому пути идут многие, мечтают пойти даже так, многие коммунистические партии всего мира. И я хочу сегодня передать привет вот здесь, с площади Ленина, народ, Донецкой Народной Республики, коммунистам, коммунистической партии Великобритании, марксистской марксистской коммунистической партии Великобритании, поздравить их с этим праздником. Это наш общий праздник. Мы показали российские, тогда, э, российские коммунисты во главе с Лениным, показали путь, по которому надо идти. Рано или поздно мы уверены, что все человечество должно пойти по этому пути. Вот. Хочется приложить всем нам усилия, чтобы этот путь был короче. Но какой бы он ни был, длинный, короткий, мы все равно будем идти и вести человечество за собой. Другого пути человечества нет. Или капиталистический тупик, или движение по пути социализма. В этом сегодня главное противоречие и главное 
главное противоречие и главная надежда человечества. Путь социализма. Он спасет весь мир. С праздником, дорогие товарищи! Short and sweet, but I think you can uh, uh, all agree with those very profound words. Fantastic to have those words from the Donbass, and we know this titanic struggle continues to unfold, and we see the defeat of the proxy fascist forces of NATO. So, fantastic to have those. insufficient to absorb capital or furnish enough labor and resources, yet lack the colonies the established, the established imperialists held. But these older imperialist nations already controlled most of the world's peoples and resources. A world war to redivide the labor force, markets and those resources was triggered by these contradictions. Alongside this, a great advancement in Marx's theory was achieved. Lenin brought Marx's work forward to the conditions of imperialism and proletarian revolution. In his work, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, he defined imperialism, showed clearly its nature and development, and made clear the intrinsic economic laws that caused the endless cycles of wars we still to this day suffer under. Russia, a once great imperial power, after their revolution, could now develop down a path that didn't rely on the subjugation of this or that country to bring back super profits to its bourgeoisie and the small traitorous strata of bribed workers, the labor aristocracy. In fact, socialist construction allowed a system that was built on the labor, democratically organized and centrally planned, of a class-conscious workforce that rejected the oppression of others to maintain a good standard of living. For the first time since class society appeared, the mass of the workers would hold state power. Russia would be a dictatorship of the proletariat. As I said before, containing these earth-shaking movements within borders is impossible, and nor could these ideas be contained. The shining example of the working class seizing political power and building their own state, combined with distribution of Marxist literature, led workers in the oppressed and oppressing countries alike to question the status quo, question the divine right to rule by minority classes, which under feudalism was bestowed by God and under capitalism by dint of owning raw materials, means of production and money, to question the lie that to get our bread and housing, we must hold other peoples in servitude. The adept navigation of the national question by Comrade Lenin and Comrade Stalin showed how peace between peoples could be achieved. It wasn't just workers who saw this lodestar. The ruling class did too. 
the landowners and capitalists saw the future laid out ahead of them, a future where the exalted few would be shorn of their ability to live decadent lifestyles off the backs of countless workers and peasants. A war-weary yet hardened and trained mass of workers, armed with the knowledge of what their class can achieve if organized and united, could not be ignored or beaten into submission. The struggles of the workers of Britain at this time, combined with leadership by a vanguard of advanced workers, able to answer the question, what do we replace capitalism with? Forced many concessions from the British ruling class. Housing reforms, the women's vote, and some social security measures were won in the wake of World War I. But these necessarily fell short of true change. The ruling class wouldn't ever peacefully loosen their vice grip on economic or political power. You could compare these meagre reforms of the right to food, housing, education, medicine, and abolition of unemployment amongst many more achieved by the Soviet Union over just a couple of decades, and all without exploiting a workforce, home or abroad. Compare this to the funding of concessions that British workers won, which have always been based on the increased oppression and exploitation of the peoples under the control of the British Empire. The blockading of the rising masses was somewhat achieved, but this was followed by a steady erosion of everything we, had, we thought we had won for good. Following World War II, another wider package of concessions was granted to the working class, this time given by a coalition of bourgeois parties, Labour and Tory, in fear of what the British working class would do after seeing the gains of Soviet socialism and the smashing of the fascist hordes by the victorious Red Army. On the basis of these reforms, the British class did not push forward to achieve state power, allowing itself instead to be bought off by the introduction of the NHS, by the massive reduction in unemployment, by the creation of social housing, and the nationalization of many key industries. But all this was a mere shadow of what the Soviet Union had achieved itself decades earlier. Yet it was presented by the communists at the time as the first step in a progression of peaceful reforms that would eventually bring us to socialism in Britain. The Soviet Union, led by the Communist Party, went even further, not only refusing to squeeze one nation to support another, but by actively supporting nearly every, every liberation effort across the globe. This spirit of internationalism is fundamental to a communist view of the world. Ultimately, no worker can truly be free while some of us live in chains. This is the antithesis to bourgeois nationalism, racism, social chauvinism, something which has and still does hamper class consciousness in Britain today. Until that changes, British workers will have forever compare their padded chains favorably with the sharp and heavy chains of the oppressed countries, forgetting that a chain is a chain, no matter how comfortably it is wrought. More advanced workers, thanks to the proletarian internationalism put into practice by the Soviets, would chafe even at a featherweight, silk-lined manacle and stand with their brothers and sisters, united by class, not by identity, size of wage packet or skin colour. Britons, Marxists or not, can clearly see the downturn in our living conditions can see the limitations of individual efforts to offset this and are looking for answers. These are very hard to find, thanks to the unrelenting propaganda and falsification of history by the bourgeoisie and their hired lackeys. But we communists are duty bound to counteract this. We must be honest, pragmatic, but always hopeful. Workers are lied to so often by our schools, universities, news and media that when they see the truth, it feels like a cold glass of water in the desert. So we must tell them that this downturn isn't a blip, a bump in the road. It is a return to working life under capitalism, unpadded by concessions, the concessions we've had since World War II.
British society is returning to normal. A normal in which the great majority of people eking out a bare sustenance while a shrinking number of super-rich exploiters live a life of luxury. The standard of living for the majority of workers is steadily being leveled down to that of our brothers and sisters in the oppressed countries. We will see that to capital. A worker is a worker is a worker, no matter where they were born. Capital sees it this way. It's time for workers to see it this way too. I believe we workers are slowly seeing this more clearly. But we don't have the time for conditions to bring this understanding. We must study scientific socialism in order to bring these ideas to the masses and hasten the day when we are able to stand up as a class. The recent mass rejection of imperialist propaganda, the example being the rejection by many of the imperialist media narrative that somehow Israel is a victim while destroying the Palestinian people, gives me much hope that the time when our children will look back and be befuddled that we ever lived in such a system as this will arrive sooner rather than later. <laughs> Since the emergence of class society, humanity has suffered through a dark, cold winter. In the wake of the glorious struggles of the Paris Commune of 1871, the first warm winds of a new life were felt. But as many of us know, there sometimes comes a false spring and a seeming retreat back into winter. Winter returned, but the idea of the spring to come was not forgotten, in fact could not be forgotten. A retreat does not mean permanent failure. It is a chance to pause, learn from mistakes, and take the time to plan our next advance. For the enemy, the retreat after Paris was seen as complete defeat. Capitalist reaction became fierce, bold. It became overconfident. In the interim between the Paris Commune and the next great step in the proletarian struggle, the Great October Revolution, movements all over the world for revolutionary independence from imperialism and its feudal supports were trampled, and certain workers in the imperialist countries were bribed to maintain social peace. The enemy thought themselves the victors. They didn't understand that the runaway development of monopoly capitalism and its subsequent descent into parasitism, decadence and moribundity were creating the conditions for its undoing, deepening all the inequalities and contradictions of that system, spreading them across the world and creating the forces that will enable its destruction. The great achievements of the October Revolution suffered a severe blow with the triumph of Khrushchevite revisionism in the CPSUB of 1956, which over a period of 30 years through the so-called reforms led to the collapse of the once glorious USSR. Heavy though that blow was, history has not stopped as the bourgeois ideologues would have us believe. Learning from the experience of developments in the USSR the proletarian and the press masses of the world are bound to chart a course for their social liberation. There is absolutely no reason for us to be despondent. Capitalism has no future to offer humanity. The future belongs to communism. Thank you. So much. It's a difficult and momentous thing to take your first steps into political life. I think we can all remember that. Josh has been our proud member for a couple of years now and has come right to the heart of our organisation. But to come and speak in front of you, you might not think of yourself as a forbidding audience, but you are. <laughs> so uh, well done, Josh. For sharing some very profound insights of his, of his steps into Marxism that we all share and we all hope to master in order to take to a wider audience 
and facilitate the struggle that we all know must come and liberate humanity from its current turmoil and chaos. So, Josh, thank you so much. I'm gonna, uh, I was going to save our comrades from the Cuban embassy till the very last, but they do have another engagement. Um, if I asked one short speech before you, is that okay, or do you want to speak next? <laughs> I want to keep her with us as long as possible. So I'm going to... I know, I'm so sorry. So I'm going to ask Comrade Gion from the party, uh, but the Col de Renaissance, <laughs> uh, the Communist France, so the, the Communist Col de Renaissance in France to come and speak to us. So it's wonderful to have him with us, Comrade Gion. And afterwards, we're going to hear Comrade Gion. Let me pop that on you. Is that okay? Okay. And then uh, you have to speak right directly into the mic. Is that okay? Hi, hi, comrade. Um, hola, camaradas. Pri hola. Privet tovarici. Um, first of all, thank you uh, uh, for the invitation. It's an honor for the PRCF to be here. Um, and secondly, uh, excuse me. Forgive me for my English. It's been a long time I, I've not practiced. So I have a message from the, the poll uh, of Revival Communist in France um, to, the, to the potentially exterminating world conflict fanned by the Euro-Atlantic imperialists. We must oppose the salutary counter-offensive of the working class against big capital. 106 years ago, on the 7th of November 1917, under the impetus of the Bolshevik party, the proletarian of Petrograd and Moscow rose up victoriously against Kerensky provisional government, which behind socialist verbiage with no concrete contained, uh, quoted the bourgeoisie, bypassed the workers, Soviets, continued the, the imperialist war, refused the immediate de democratic nationaliz nationalization of land, and left power to the cap capitalists in the factories, who starved, who starved the population to punish it for its revolutionary commitment. The same Kerensky government, which had remained passive in the face of the counter-revolutionary putsch attempted by the Tsarist General Kornilov had also democratically, dem democratically proscribed Lenin and banned his party during the summer of 1917. Moreover, during those 10 days that shook the world and were meticulously chronicled by the great American reporter John Reed, who was present on the spot, uh, an unprecedented democratic debate took place in Russia. The outcome was the solution put forward by the Bolshevik vanguard. Immediate peace with no annexation or takeovers. Land for the peasants. Workers' control of factories. The right to complete self-determination for the nations formerly oppressed by the Tsar and a resolute move toward the dictatorship of the proletariat and its allies. <laughs> the, the establishment of a free federation of sovereign Soviet nations with equal rights within the USSR, the break with the Social Democratic International, which had become pro-imperialist and counter-revolutionary, and from 1990, the creation of a new communist international prevailed among the proletarian and peasant masses of Russia. Without the profound, the profound agreement of the popular masses with the Bolshevik program put forward by Eric proletarians and vanguard intellectuals, the new Red Army of workers and peasants would never have been able to sweep away the reactionary counterattack of the whites, supported by numerous foreign intervention, including Clemenceau's French government, and the Red Army would never subsequently have been able to crush the invisible Wehrmacht, which had conquered France 
and the wall of Central and Eastern Europe in the twinkling of an eye. General de Gaulle recognized this when, uh, on a state visit to Moscow in uh, 1944, he loyally declared in front of Stalin, French people know that Soviet Russia played the main role in their liberation. Obviously, a phrase that has been carefully buried, buried nowadays by all the Atlanticist historians from France and Navarre. For almost 70 years thereafter, the USSR allied since the end of the Second World War with the people's democracies of Eastern Europe, then gradually joined uh, on the socialist path by Mao's people's China, Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam, and Fidel and Che Guevara's Cuba proved that it's possible to organize social development without capitalists, to bring medicine, housing, sport, culture, and education within everyone's reach to turn a backyard country into the world's second largest power uh, and, and, and the world's leading scientific power in a short space of time. Gagarin's name can sum up. Just as it was possible in Russia, with the pro proletariat in power, to put women and men on an equal political footing from the outset, right to contraception, abortion, painless childbirth promoted by the USSR, divor divorce by mutual consent, women's right to vote, etc. It was also possible and necessary for proletarian state fighting imperialism to support all the national liberation struggles in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Unfortunately, the world's first historic experiment in the socialist society launched in October 17 and ended up falling victim to the blows, to the blows of imperialism, in particular the huge anti-Soviet crusade uh, for war and nuclear weapons led by Reagan, Thatcher, Mitterrand, and Cole from the 1980 to 1984. Um, the 1984 Euro missile crisis, humanity came close to the abyss, as it was in 1962 during the East West standoff over Cuba and Berlin. But also the internal betrayal by the neo Muniqua. Who took, who, who took over the leadership of the CPSU following the deaths of Brezhnev, Andropov, and Konstantin Chernenko. Without going back to the general condition, which led to the devastating triumph of this li liquid liquidating, liquidating clique, which, were, which was cherished by the West and despised by the Russian of today, the historic role of Gorbachevism that quintessence of revisionism and opportunism, which had already been summed up in the West by Euro-communism, more and more European Union and less and less communism. It was created to confuse the Soviets with a new political thought, which was anti-Leninist and which claimed to prefer the universal values of humanity instead of the class interests interests of the proletariat. It was created to confuse the Soviets with an anti-Leninist new political thought which claimed to prefer the universal values of humanity instead of the class interests of the proletariat. A way to be politically correct to the Western imperialism denying the leading role of the proletariat in the struggle for peace. Actually, a way sacrificing the socialists come to the impossible Soviet-American convergence, Aban abandoning to their fate the anti-imperialist struggles, Central America, Africa, Palestine, etc. And finally, a way leaving Russia, including capitalist and post-Soviet Russia, more encircled and besieged uh, than ever by US imperialism which had obviously not changed its nature. As we can see today, 
all those who renounced, 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 pardon, renounced uh, the USSR and communism, including the K K K KGB leaders of those days who sided with Yeltsin, have been reduced to fight directly on Russia's western borders against the Russophobic alliance of the U European Union NATO. American and German imperialism, the, la the latter desperate for Stalingrad revenge. With the Hitler nostalgic, Bandera and co, who dominate in Kiev and the Baltic states today. The result for the world is terrible in terms of the planetary domination of the capitalist oligarchy. Mainly the North American oligarchy, which is suffocating the world with its adulterated dollar, its omnipresent US army, its sanctions that are unbearable for unthinking peoples, and its alliance with the racist Israeli states and with fundamentalist phallocratic Saudi Arabia, the record in Europe is also the establishment of a German Atlantic European Union steered regionally by Berlin, which has succeeded by means of the euro aligned with the Dutch mark and with a total, collu uh, total collusion of the master of the CAC 40, CAC 40 stock exchange in Paris, and the unique Maastricht party, all the party in France uh, uh, with European Union, as you can, you can know, which has crushed the industries of the European partners after the reunified Federal Republic of Germany by annexing the Democratic Republic of Germany. After that, they are dislocated neighboring countries notably Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, now things have reached a critical point where at the instigation of American imperialism, which is universally arsonist from Ukraine to Korea, from China's sea with Taiwan to Palestine, the world is on the threshold of a new exterminating world conflict. It could irreversibly devastate the human environment and exterm exterminate the human race, supposedly in the name of human rights. All this is taking place against a backdrop of fascization in Europe. Ursula von der Leyen, who claims to be defending our democ democratic values in Ukraine, did not have a word to say in in condemnation for the Italian and Swedish fascists who have just seized the reign in their respective countries. And she has no fear, no shame about arming the pro-Nazi regime of Kiev without limit, as we can see with the neo-Nazis of Aydar and Svoboda, also known as the Ukrainian National Socialist Party. A shame. In that way, the European Union par parliament, parliament voted on the 19th of September 2019 a resolution which odiously equated the Third Reich with the country of Stalingrad. It clearly called not to fight the racist far-right parties, but all those in Europe who continue to display the workers and peasant emblem of true communism, unlike others who cowardly abandon this compromising symbol in time. <laughs> However, Contrary to what the ideal, ideologue of capitalism foolishly believed when they spoke of the death of communism and the end of his history in the 90s, history did not end with the counter-revolutionary collapse of the European socialist camp. On the one hand, the People's Republic of China, which after the Maoist experiment, the collapse of the USSR and the attempt by the most pro-American elements in China to destabilize the government, as in Tiananmen, 
had chosen to join neoliberal globalization in order to modernize its productive forces. Popular Republic of China is now openly competing with American imperialism. The PRC is proposing an alternative development project for Africa, for Eurasia, uh, as the new Silk Roads. And above all, under the impetus of Xi Jinping, it is strongly reviving Marxism, socialism, and the idea of joint global action by the communist parties that have not joined the Euro-Atlanticist bloc. All things which, un admittedly, do not resolve all the contradictions of Chinese-style de development, but which cannot be brushed aside out of and by those who want to give a chance to a future, a fu a future socialist France emancipating itself from both the American-German axis and the destructive tutelage of the French oligarchy. Moreover, the counter-hegemonic powers of BRICS Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which are not far from comprising the majority of human beings, are putting up less and less with the suffocating Uncle Sam's hegemony and his European vassals, even if there is no reason to idealize the leaders of the major capitalist countries affiliated to the BRICS. And if, of course, we must continue to support as a matter of priority, the Russian, South African, Brazilian, and Indian communists in this country, not to, not to mention, on the other hand, the Russian, South African, uh, Brazilian, and Indian communists, uh, uh, without forgetting another, and, and another level, the Iranian communists. In Africa, colonialism and neocolonialism, including French colonialism are aboard from Chad to Burkina Faso through Mali and Niger. In Latin America, Cuba and the Alba countries are facing, facing a veritable siege from the US empire, but they are holding fir firm and the popular left is even gaining ground across the continent. In the Middle East, US imperialism has had to retreat in Syria hegemonic imperialist domination in is, is in crisis from Afghanistan to Libya. And the Palestinian people continue their heroic struggle against the predatory Israeli government armed by Washington and shamefully supported by Macron. This is all the more true given that the European Union, which is sub subservient to NATO, is already in the throes of an explosive, even deadly crisis. It has been exacerbated by the Brexit, then by the boomerang sanctions imposed by Washington and on Russia, and indirectly on its German European competitors. In addition, Olaf Scholz's obvious German cavalier seul, ridiculing the French myth of the Franco-German couple, as we could see with the Scholz's recent state visit to Beijing shows the possibility that exists for frankly communist militants, but also for the class trade union movement if they dare to take the lead in a progressive anti-fascist and anti-imperialist Frexit ori oriented towards the reconstruction of national sovereignty towards a resolute class confrontation with the monopoly oligarchy and towards, towards its properly revolutionary outcome, socialism for France. This would be the greatest contribution that the French pro proletariat could ever make to world proletarian solid solidarity. In reality, there is no op opposition between the idea of a broad anti-imperialist rally against the world war and for de-escalation in Europe and the fact that is it that it's uh, up to the communists to take the lead in this broad rally for life uh, that Yuri Andropov called the world front of reason in 1995. And this without for a second abandoning the expression of our own class analysis of the whole, the whole range of national and international political question. This revival of the class workers movement 
is linked to the increasingly urgent reconstruction of a genuine Communist Party, which the French Communist Party is no longer, being totally absent from the anti-European Union and anti-NATO struggle. The poll for communist revival in France is contributing to this re reconstruction through its theoretical and militant work and organizationally through the work of our imminent Sixth National Conference. A final word to our Russian comrades who from Donetsk under the bombs to Red Square in Moscow are preparing to celebrate Red October by defending their country and the Donbass mining region in the front ranks against the European Union NATO allied with the Nazi and by upholding the Leninist heritage castigated by Putin. But it is our duty and our common future to revive the fraternal links between the country of Robespierre and Lenin, between the heirs of the French Revolution and La Commune de Paris and those of, Tallin and those of Stalingrad and the great October Socialist Revolution. On this 106th anniversary, which is unfortunately being held under an inky sky, but where the embers of the class struggle are glowing beneath the temporary ashes of the counter-revolution, honor and courage to the heirs of the greatest revolution in history, the October Revolution, Slava Lenina Tovarici. Comrades, it is a great privilege to share with you again this celebration of the 106th anniversary of the October Socialist Revolution, one of the most transcendental events of the 20th century. Even if some media insist on the mission, the importance of the revolution that led to the founding of the world's first socialist state and opened a path of hope for the colonialized and exploited countries and peoples. The October Revolution had an influence all over the world on all continents on all peoples, and of course, it had a great impact in Cuba. 
the revolution and the battle for the multifaceted development that was being weighed in what was the most backward and part of its time also reached Latin America, where the first communist parties began to emerge, among them Cuba's Communist Party, when we were a república mediatizada, a pseudo-republic subjected to the imperialist domination of the United States. The historical leader of the Cuban Revolution, Fidel Castro Ruz, mercifully summed up the meaning of the October Socialist Revolution for Cuba when, in 1907, at the commemoration of Lenin's 100th birthday anniversary, he said, and I quote, without the 1970 October Revolution, Cuba would not have become the first socialist country in Latin America. <laughs> later, later, in 1972, in a profound reflection on the roots of our socialist re revolution, Fidel stated, the revolutionary process in Cuba is the confirmation of the extraordinary force of the ideas of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, unquote. The principles of equality, solidarity, internationalism, social justice, the right of the people to self-determination, independence, and sovereignty, which underpinned the October Revolution, have been at the heart of the policies of the Cuban Revolution. We have never, <laughs> we have never given up the objective of achieving social welfare for all Cubans with the greatest possible equity, equity, equality, and justice for all. It has not been an easy road to travel, and the challenges over more than 60 years have, at times, seemed unsurmountable. But here we are. We have never, we have never stood still. We have taken the risks, adapt our policies without abandoning the principles so that the revolution did not, did not lost. In his concept of the revolution, Fidel summoned up the need to transform and change whatever was necessary without abandoning the humanist principles that characterize our process. <coughs> Dear comrades, I talk a little about the first <laughs> socialist country in Latin America. As all you know, we are facing a complex situation since 2019. The challenges we face in the economy are very large and complex. There are no easy solutions, and some of them carry risks. In 2022, the Cuban economy did not reach the expected growth. There was a slight growth 1.8%, which is part of the gradual recovery process, but is insufficient. Also, we had to face major disasters that caused the loss of tens of human life and billions in damage. You, remember, you also remember uh, the explosion in one of the most valuable hotels in Havana, the huge fire in a depot in Matanzas, hurricane, and something similar uh, climate events. For 2023, the GDP is expected to grow by 3%. Three, 3%. In the first quarter of the year, a very light improvement of some productive and service activities, the growth of social services, health, 
education, culture, and sports, the increase in employment, and the implementation and diversification of the new economic actors continue. But the recovery of the tourism industry, which continue to be impacted by the Cuba's inclusion on the US list of states sponsors of terrorism, will not achieve with the project 3.5 million visitors for this year, but chose a pace of rules that should surpass all indicators for 2021 and 2022. As you know, tourism is one of the main sources of income for Cuba. All of our efforts have been severely affected by the suffocating effects of the economic war against Cuba. There is no other way to describe it. Some of the most harmful measures for the economy and, to of, and for our population have been as follows. Application of the Title III of the Hans Burton that allows actions to be taken in the United States against any foreign citizens who make business with Cuba. Um, uh, by the way, all of US presidents since 1996, including Trump, in the first two years of his term, have consecutively used their executive power to waive the application of Title III. But later, Donald Trump again imposed the Title III of the Health Burton. Persecution of full supplies, threatening and blackmailing the companies that supply fuel to Cuba, and those that engage in this international transport without having any legal or moral authority to do so. Persecution to the provision of Cuban medical services abroad. Inclusion of the arbitrary Cuba restricted list is another list, <laughs> including Cuban entities with which American citizens are prohibited from interacting, which is aimed at affecting the tourism sector. And last, but not the least, the harmful inclusion in the list of state sponsors of terrorism. The same day of the former designation of Cuba on that list, January 21, 2021, 45 banks around the world closed their operations with Cuban entities. And dozens of banks closed their operations with our embassies. Due to its extraterritorial effects, private industry, religious groups, non-governmental organizations, universities, and even governments in any country run the risk of suffering retaliation for almost any type of aid, business, investment, or trade with Cuban citizens. However, what the blockade has not been able to stop is the solidarity with Cuba. The blockade will be there for who knows how long. So we must, despite all the difficulties, do this better without abandoning for a second our struggle for the lifting of the longest and the most genocidal sanction system regime ever applied against a nation for more than 60 years. You know, uh, and all of this is, be is because Cuba is a socialist country and decide to continue to be a socialist country and have page and have and right now, uh, continue to pay the high price for the side our destiny, because we are free and we are sovereign, and we want to be socialists. <laughs> it might 
take longer to achieve our goals, but we will not pursue neoliberal policies. We will not privatize education health systems. We will not affect the social welfare. We make enormous efforts every day to protect the most vulnerable. We will not abandon our internationalist duty. Let me conclude with a quote from Fidel about the Communist Party of Cuba. In my personal opinion, it reflects the fidelity to the ideas that were raised in that glorious October and which still inspire the Cuban Revolution. Fidel said, this party, our party, was born of two essential, fundamental, unvaluable factors, the union of all revolutionaries and a scientific doctrine, a political revolutionary philosophy, Marxism-Leninism. From the union and the idea, from unity and doctrine, in the crucible of a revolutionary process, this party has been formed. And these two things we will always have to wash over. Unity and doctrine, because they are our fundamental pillars." Unquote. Thank you very much. so much comrade Barbara. Comrade Barbara will have to leave us very shortly. You're welcome to stay with us on the, on the stage or go to your seat if you prefer. That's absolutely amazing. So, so Rose, some absolutely beautiful points uh, and I can elaborate on them for a whole speech. But how disgusting and ironic is it for the United States of America whose armies are divided up not by its home district but by the continents of the earth which illegally occupies a base, Guantanamo Bay, on Cuba and refuses to cede it back to the Cuban government, who rightfully own it, who continues to extradite illegally or rendition the victims of its criminal occupations from elsewhere onto the soil of Cuba and torture them there, which currently has just given $100 billion to be divided between its proxy puppets Israel and its proxy puppets in the, the fascist puppets in Ukraine to wage ongoing war against the people, not to oppose the genocide in Palestine, but to support it. How disgusting is it that they dare to place a country like Cuba, which strives for freedom, on their list of terrorist nations? What a disgusting, hypocritical irony. I'm going to call on comrades of Stephen Cho from the World anti imperial Goodbye, comrades. Okay, Okay. I'm sorry. Apparently, I'm not going to call on you next. No problem. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. I'm going to call someone. I'm so sorry. Uh, so, sorry, there's been a change in program. I'm going to call on um, Minister Zhao Fei please, from the Embassy of the People's Republic of China. We are very grateful. <laughs> to Comrade we are humbled and deeply aware that it is the economic and political leadership given by the People's Republic of China by their incredible development and steadfastness in the face of imperialist provocation, which is changing the entire balance 
of the world today towards a multipolar order, which is giving the space for so many peoples to choose another path to escape imperialism and to loosen themselves from the grip, the heavy-handed iron grip of Anglo-American imperialism. So please join with me in welcoming uh, uh, Ambassador, um, sorry, the Minister uh, Zhao Fei uh, from the China, Pe People's Republic of Revolutionary China. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. Dear comrades, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It gives me great pleasure to attend this celebration of the anniversary of the great October Socialist Revolution and meet friends both old and new here. This year marks the 106th anniversary of the victory of the great October Socialist Revolution an epoch-making event in world history. The victory of the October Revolution turned socialism from theory into reality, breaking the domination of capitalism in the world. It profoundly changed the trajectory of human history and like a beacon, influenced and inspired the world's proletarian revolution to enter a new and magnificent era. <laughs> the reverberations of the October Revolution brought Marxism, Leninism to China, pointing out the direction forward and offering a brand new choice for the Chinese people in their struggle to survive. In the great awakening of the Chinese people and nation, and in the close integration of Marxism, Leninism, and the Chinese workers' movement, the Communist Party of China came into being. <laughs> the emergence of the CPC was a groundbreaking breaking event that profoundly changed the future and destiny of the development of the Chinese nation in modern times and profoundly changed the trend and paradigm of the world. Since then, the Chinese people have had a path leader in their struggle for national independence and people's liberation, and for prosperity of the country and well-being of the people. And the mindset has turned from passivity to proactivity. Over the past 100 years, since the founding of the CPC, Generations of the Chinese communists have kept integrating the basic principles of Marxism with China's specific realities and with China's fine traditional culture, and have continuously adapted Marxism to the Chinese context and the needs of our times. Especially since entering the new era with the courage to make theoretical explorations and innovations, the CPC has from an entirely new perspective, deepened its understanding of the laws that underlie governance by a communist party, the development of socialism, and the evolution of human society. It has achieved major theoretical innovations which are encapsulated in the Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. This is This is the Marxism of contemporary China and of the 21st century that guides China and, her, and has a global impact. It provides guidance to the CPC in its thinking and spirit in the new era. Thanks to the continuous and arduous efforts of the generations of the Chinese communists, we have achieved the first sanitary goal to build a moderately prosperous society in all respects in China. China has transformed itself from a poor agricultural country into the world's second largest economy, the biggest manufacturing country and trader of goods, and the top country on foreign exchange reserves. The average life expectancy in China 
has increased from 35 years to 78.2 years. Wow. And, and we have put in place in the world's largest medical, educational, and social sec security systems. <laughs> this year, in the face of the sluggish global economy and turbulent international situation, China's economic performance has been outstanding. In the first three quarters, China's GDP grew by 5.2% grew by year-on-year, ranking among the best of the world's major economies. Economies. Several authoritative international organizations predict that China, China's economic growth will exceed 5% this year, and its contribution to the world's economic growth will reach one-third. The fundamentals of China's economy, characterized by strong resilience, great potential, and long-term sustainability, remain unchanged. In October 2022, the 20th Party Congress made it clear that from now on, the central task of the CPC will be to lead the Chinese people of all ethnic groups into a concerted effort to realize the second sanitary goal of building China into a great modern socialist country in all respects and to advance the reju rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts through a Chinese path to modernization. We have full confidence and capability to create new and greater miracles in the new era, our new journey. The CPC remains a global vision. In the face of major challenges unseen in the century, the global economic and security challenges and the ever-increasing deficits of peace, develop development, security, and governance around the world, General Secretary Xi Jinping has called for the building of a human community, community with a shared future, actively implementing the Belt and Road Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiative. and building an open, inclusive, clean, and beautiful world that, enjoy, that enjoys lasting peace, universal security, and common prosperity. At the opening ceremony of the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation held not long ago, President Xi Jinping proposed that all countries should join hand to pursue global modernization that enhances peaceful development and mutually beneficial cooperation and brings prosperity to all. China will work with all parties involved to deepen Belt and Road partnerships of cooperation, usher their cooperation into a new stage of high quality development and make relentless efforts to achieve modernization for all countries. Congress, from the day of its birth, the CPC has unequivocally written Marxism onto its banner. Along the way, our party has never wavered in, in its firm belief in Marxism, whether in good times or tough ones. Marxism reveals the laws of development of the human society, points out the path for humankind to seek its own liberation and advances the process of human civilization. It provides powerful tools guiding us in understanding and changing the world. As General Secretary Xi Jinping has pointed out, at the fundamental level, we owe the success of our party and socialism with Chinese characteristics to the fact that Marxism works, particularly when it, when it is adapted to the Chinese context and the need of our times. 
The CPC stands ready to work closely with Marxist political parties in all countries to jointly work for new development of Marxism in the 21st century and advance the course of human progress and build a human community with a shared future. Thank you. inspired by the events of communism that shaped the last century and continue to shape our ongoing class struggle. October Revolution, we're here to, today to celebrate, was unquestionably the earth-shaking event that broke the iron ties of imperialism, in Lenin's word. But another event which sent shockwave, seismic shockwave through the world was the Chinese People Revolution. And we still remember with great joy the words of Mao when Finally, after World War II in 1949, October, when he came to Tiananmen Square and pronounced very profoundly and very simply that the Chinese people have stood up. And as you quite rightly say, Comrade Feng, Marxism works and it is built in steel, in concrete, in new, new development, in renewed economy, in the advance of people's lives that we've seen in all the different countries where Marxism has hold sway, where they have had the leadership of the working people, uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat, socialism, the actual rule of workers. We're constantly presented with problems in this country which we're told are insurmountable. It's so sad that 13 million people in Britain, the sixth richest country on earth, don't quite have enough money to eat well. You know, food insecurity, live in poverty. 13 million is almost a quarter of our population. You know, we, don't, we have infrastructure which is failing. We have schools that are failing. We have hospitals which are being gutted from the inside. Waiting lists of millions of people for simple medical procedures. Whilst we see other countries that have embraced socialism in a different way of life, who put the people first above profit, surge ahead and surpass us. But it is also a gift, a practical gift to the world that you give an example. This is why the vindictive blockade upon Cuba, this is why the vindictive struggle to do down, to try and divide, ferment instability, which is the stock in trade of our own imperialist class. And our next speaker is also from a country which has known you know, nothing but a century of struggle after struggle, first to liberate itself from Japanese colonialism. Then, having victoriously liberated itself, to liberate itself from US intervention in a colossal and genocidal war from 1950 to 53. A war which, you know, the, the, the victorious conclusion of that war saw for the first time the defeat of US imperialism. And just at a time when our Cuban comrades led by Fidel were storming for the first time the Moncada barracks. This shows you that our movement is world-encompassing in its embrace, that the struggle of the workers won't cease until we have victory, and the struggle surges ahead now in this country and now in that. But we need to take comfort in our common victories, take the common lessons from our common struggle. And so I hope you will join me very much in welcoming our comrade from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, comrade Kim uh, Song-ji, who is there uh, minister, so please welcome him to stage to share his thoughts on this 106th anniversary of the uh, great Socialist October Revolution. Comrade Kim, thank you so much for being here. So, hello everyone. Yes. Good to see all of you here today. So, uh, before beginning my speech, I'd like to send my warm greetings to <coughs> Comrade Hapalbra and Comrade Ella Rul 
as well as Jotibra and organizers. Thank you. <coughs> The victory of the socialist October Revolution in Russia, marked by special events on the history of mankind, and the victory of the former Soviet Union against the aggression of the fascist Germany and against the invasion of the international reactionary forces, including the imperialist monster. The victory of the Great Fatherland Liberation War was a victory of justice and a historical of the unified strength of the people who worked for the socialist cause. There is a fierce confrontation between progress and reaction in the international stage today. Imperialist and international reactionary forces are trying to prevent the advance of history and eradicating the people's sovereignty. People's independence and peaceful of exploits are carried out in a fierce confrontation with the imperialist forces. It is a human nature to live independently and development. It is the common ideology of the independent people that all nations, all peoples, should achieve the equal rights and national prosperity in a peaceful environment. This novelist ideology of the progress of mankind can be only realized through a struggle against the imperialist forces for erad eradicating him. Imperialism is the main enemy to prevent the movement of the popular masses for independent and also imperialism is the most, most dangerous aggress, fierce to block popular masses of the independent. <clears throat> Apart from the struggle against imperialism, people cannot defend the sovereignty of the country and the dignity of the nation and build a new world of independence. The anti-imperialism struggle is a confrontation between justice and injustice. <laughs> Without unity, <clears throat> we cannot win the confrontation with the international imperialist forces, and we cannot advance history. If we united, we could become stronger. If we scattered, we could become weaker. If the popular masses fight firmly under the banner of independence and peace, the imperialist forces wouldn't be able to run. So the imperialist forces are most afraid of unity of anti-imperialist forces. The imperialist forces are small number, and the people who are desiring the independence cover the fewest number in the world. Our Korean in the national suffering was regarding Comrade Kim Il-sung as a shining star and united in the center of him for fighting with anti-Japanese aggressors. At last, our Korean greeted the Liberation Day and also our Korean People's Army defeated the U.S. imperialists and protected our sovereignty from U.S. invasion in the Korean War due to the United. <laughs> the unity of the progressive people is based on the spirit of national independence. When the progressive people unite on the base of independence, in the first place of prosperity development of a nation, it can become solidarity and powerful. It is the law of historical development that the people's independence exploits. Today, the imperialist forces have been trying to prevent the advanced movement of the era. <coughs> the progressive people 
of the world are firmly united under the banner of peace and patriotism, deeply engraving the truth of the history. We have to keep moving forward for the independence. Thank you. significant uh, event uh, marking on the 106th anniversary of the Soviet Union. 
I will read out the speech instead of the Stefan Zhu, coordinator of the Korean International Forum and organizer of the World Anti-Imperialist Platform. Anti-imperialist independent forces will certainly win the just war. World War, II, World war III is underway. The war in Ukraine, which began with the might of coup in 2014, escalated with Russian special military operations in 2022. As of 2023, the probabilities of expansions of the war in Eastern Europe and of outbreak of war in East Asia are rising. In addition, the recent outbreak of the war in Palestine and its immediate escalation into the war in the Middle East are further increasing military tensions in Eastern, Asia, Eastern Europe and East Asia. The flames of World War III are spreading from Ukraine to Taiwan and South Korea through Palestine. World War I was an inter-imperialist war. While the fact that the weak link in the chain of imperialism could be broken first with the colonial wars between imperialists was the objective condition favorable for the victory of the revolution, combining the Bolsheviks armed with Leninism with the Soviet was the subjective force, a decisive factor for the victory of the revolution. Lenin's theory of converting the inter-imperialist war into a domestic war and the theory suppressing these counter-revolutionary forces was derived from the historical lesson of the Paris Commune. World War II was a world anti-fascist war. The Soviet Union won World War II by forming a world anti-fascist front with US imperialism and the British imperialism. While World War I created the first socialist country, World War II led to socialist camps on a global scale. After World War II, the imperialist camps were put on the defensive as they declared the Cold War and quad it around the US imperialism. World War III is essentially similar to World War II. It is not an inter-imperialist war, but a continuation and the succession of the World War II, a world anti-fascist war. This is because socialist North Korea and China form a world anti-imperialist front with capitalist Russia, which has a socialist heritage. The war in Ukraine is an anti-imperialist and anti-fascist war a liberation war and a preventive war. And the war in Palestine. <laughs> and the war in Palestine is an anti-imperialist war, an anti-Zionist war, and a liberation war. The words <laughs> the wars in Taiwan war and South Korea, if they break out will be an anti-imperialist wars, national liberation wars, and national reunification wars. It is definitely clear on which side the justice is. In all ages, imperialism has always been the provocator of war. Imperialism can never be exonerated from the responsibility of instigating of provoking war, not only in World War I and World War II, but also in the Korean War, Vietnam War, Iraq War, and the recent wars in Ukraine and Palestine. Neo-Nazism of Zelensky government and the Zionism of the Netanyahu government are both fascist in nature. Nazism of Hitler was a variant of imperialism that fought an inter-imperialist war, but both neo-Nazism and Zionism are the puppets of imperialism, serving as a storming party troops in wars caused by imperialism. <laughs> Being a puppet of imperialism and an extreme fascist Yoon suk government in South Korea surpassed sur 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 both governments. In late August, the leaders of the US, Japan, and South Korea gathered at Camp David in the United States to form an Asian NATO. One year of Yoon suk government was full of nuclear war practice by the US, South Korea, and sometimes even Japan. 
Under the control of U.S. imperialism, Yoon Suk-yeol government accelerated its fascization and rushed toward a nuclear war against North Korea and a war in East Asia. The imperialist camp wants to dismantle Russia and China like Yugoslavia and eliminate the DPRK from its existence. Russia, China, and the DPRK have no other option but to wage a decisive struggle in self-defense against them, these extreme imperialist provocations. <laughs> the imperialist camp is trying to wage proxy wars in Eastern Europe, the Middle East and the East Asia under the new Cold War strategies to avoid its own political and economic crisis. De-risking in new Washington consensus is just a deception to put the blame for the war of the, on the opponents. The world has already entered the storm of World War III. The world, world anti-imperialist platform was formed in Paris on October 2022 with the three main goals of anti-imperialist mass struggles, ideological struggle against opportunism, and the strengthening of communist forces proposed by world anti-imperialist forces, including communist forces reflecting the grave situation of the world war. The PDP and CPGBML played an important role in this process, and we are very proud of this. World anti-imperialist platform have successfully held the international conferences and have vigorously carried out the anti-imperialist struggle in Belgrade, Serbia in December last year, Caracas, Venezuela in March this year, and Gwangju and Seoul, South Korea in May. We have also launched the platform news website and published the platform magazine strengthening the daily anti-imperialist anti-fascism propaganda war and the ideological struggle against opportunism. Raising the slogans of workers of the world unite and the united people will never de defeat it, the world anti-imperialist platform will continue the struggle for justice and the march for victory to advance the final victory of the anti-imperialist forces. As the historical experiences show, the war of justice, World War III, must be victorious. The progressive mankind will meet the new high period when the imperialism is decisively damaged and the world will be greatly transformed into a more self-determined and peaceful place. Comrades, it's inspiring. Hello, hello. Comrades, it's inspiring to see the work of the World anti imperialist platform of an increasing number of communist parties and workers' parties and movements come together from all over the globe and make a common cause. We are living, and if we had some of our banners up which have fallen down, you'd see, we, we are living in an era of the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's sometimes difficult to lose, you know, easy to lose sight of that. Fact: We're living in an era of the revolutionary transformation of decadent capitalism in its last phase into a more humanitarian system of socialism. But imperialism in its death throes is really creating untold misery for the people around the world. And really, this is what we're talking about. The working people must make common cause to hasten this process. We know that the demonstrations for Palestine will be ongoing even as we're in this meeting today, and I hope that many of you will join me and the party next weekend in London and cities across the country for the One Million Man March for Palestine. It is an incredible feat when you think about it, when you see how disorganized 
and demoralized our working class movement has become, misled by the Labour Party, by a Keir Starmer who can stand in Chatham House and say openly he doesn't believe in a ceasefire, because a ceasefire would freeze the conflict as it is, but we need to destroy Hamas. Hamas, the term used interchangeably with Palestinians. So in other words, full support for Israeli genocide. Did you see how the imperialist spokesmen flocked to Israel to have their photo taken before the world's press with Benjamin Netanyahu, this far-right extremist leader of a racist apartheid settler colonial regime well past its sell-by date? And why? Why did they all feel they had to go there? Because Israel, just the day before, had bombed a hospital, the Allah, the Allahi, the, the Baptist Hospital, one of the biggest hospitals serving 45,000 people, working class Palestinians in this densely crowded 2.3 million population Gaza city. This population itself displaced from stolen land from Israel. What an obscenity that the world's leaders, who self style themselves the leaders of the free world, have to rush to protect an ongoing genocide, and in particular, a barbaric act of murder of 500 women and children sheltering in a hospital at that time. What an absurd and disgusting contradiction. But our, almost more than that, I, I kind of expect this obscenity from the leaders of world imperialism. But the leader of the Labour Party, so-called, how long is it going to take the British workers and the left-wing movement to call out the Labour Party as just another representative of global imperialism, Anglo-American imperialism of the city of London? Is it not enough that every Labour leader that gets into power has to first meet Rupert Murdoch and get his approval, that they'll follow the policies of Anglo-American imperialism before the press will allow them sufficient coverage and support to get into government? Is that not enough? No. Keir Starmer has to say, the genocide must continue because Hamas, i.e. the Palestinians, must be destroyed. The final act, a second Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of 2.3 million Palestinians out of Gaza into Egypt. This is what our leaders of the so-called Labour Party support. And we must send a message from here that yes, we will march for Palestine, but part of that marching for Palestine means not supporting the parties and movements of imperialism. And one of those is the Labour Party, and we must declare an unrelenting struggle to separate the British working people who deserve more, are capable of more in struggle from the misleadership of this imperialist organization. And as we reflect on that huge conflagration in Palestine, let's not forget how can we forget the conflagration of an expanding NATO, Anglo-American imperialism, which in the face of its global economic crisis is seeking to pull the chestnuts out of the fire for the huge monopolies. You know, these six or seven people, you can count them on your hand, two hands maybe, <laughs> on your hands, certainly on your hands and feet. Add up, the wealth of the, add up the wealth of the richest 20 people on earth. The richest six or seven have more wealth than half the world's population, the poorest half of the world. And it's this obscenity, this constant swimming of wealth against the tide of its own concentration, uh, this vast and disgusting global military empire is set up to protect, pumping wealth from the world's poorest into the coffers of that tiny billionaire elite. And an expanding NATO spreading eastward, trying to destroy all and every opposition to the unbridled passage of capital to flow and exploit labor in every country. We're all familiar with this term, axis of, resist axis of evil. Axis of evil. Who are the axis of evil? They are every country in which the diktat of US and Anglo-American imperialism does not run. They're the countries they don't yet occupy, the countries they don't yet have bases in. And they're a diverse group. You know, hard for you to find the, you know, the ideological similarity between you know, the, the Republic of Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and the Russian Federation. They're all very distinct ideological political systems. But what they have in common is that they all prevent 
US imperialism from having unbridled access to their markets, material wealth, and resources. This is what Anglo-American imperialism hates. And this is the secret of why they hate communism and they hate, they hate the Russian Revolution so much. They hate the example of all of your countries, particularly the proletarian countries, where workers in struggle overthrew their kingdom, their privilege, their parasitism, and instituted a new republic and showed another way is possible. So it's very... So it's very important that we have an update from our comrade, comrade Steve Sweeney, who will speak next. He's been really heroically, I mean, he won't want to overblow his heroism because the people of Palestine, the people of Gaza, the people of the Donbass face the onslaught of imperialism every day. The world's poor face the onslaught of imperialism, the economic strangulation of their children, the, the, the holocaust of children who die of poverty, malnutrition, and related diseases that happen unsung everywhere throughout the globe with no memorials and no great epitaphs and no word of protest from our leaders, the upholders of the free world. They're all on the front line of this struggle, but Steve has put himself in harm's way. He's gone to the Donbass to cover the conflict unfolding there, the special military operation of the Russian Federation in resistance of the expansion of NATO imperialism, and he's put himself in the front line in the midst of a war, literally. So we salute his courage and heroism, and we really look forward to hearing his, his speech and his update on the situation there. Thank you so much, Steve. Comrades, uh, I'm a bit shorter than, than Ranji. I'm going to bring this down a little bit. <laughs> Comrades, sisters, brothers, um, it's a great honour to be invited to speak to you today. And I bring you greetings from revolutionary Donbass, and most specifically from the Donetsk People's Republic. <laughs> while, while understandably... All eyes are on the situation now unfolding in Gaza. The shelling of Donbass, the shelling of Donetsk continues every day, as it has done for the past nine years, with NATO-supplied, Western-supplied, British-supplied weapons falling into civilian areas, killing and maiming as the world turns away and closes its eyes. Now I've seen this on a daily basis. It's become so natural now that the sound of artillery shells, the sound of high Mars, the sound of storm shadows, and the sound of the heroic air defences has now just simply become part of the rhythm of the day. It's as usual as hearing traffic driving past the dogs barking, and you can distinguish between whether it's an incoming or an outgoing missile. I was um, reporting from a shop that was destroyed uh, just on the outskirts of Donetsk city centre, and it was a NATO-supplied artillery shell that had crashed through a grocery store, killing an elderly woman as she popped in at lunchtime to do her shopping. Her shopping bag was still on the floor, the blood was there, um, where she was killed and the shop workers were trying to salvage what was left of, of their stock. Most of it had been destroyed and I was outside, there was a couple of children and I saw them eyeing the bottles of whiskey that I was also eyeing um, and I think that they, you know, I looked at them and then we heard a noise, a boom, boom, a familiar noise and I kind of looked and they looked at me and said, oh, it's okay, it's air defences, it's ours, don't worry. Now, they must have been about 10 or 11 years old, um, these children, and no child should really uh, be able to distinguish what kind of sound um, is being made. They shouldn't be exposed uh, to this kind of thing, but this is now part of their daily life. Many of them have grown up knowing nothing else but NATO war on their people. Now, I often make a comparison and say that Donbass and Donetsk is like... Palestine, like the Russian Palestine. Um, there's one 
key difference, of course, which is now we have the Russian armed forces that are creating a protective barrier between, on the one side, the people of Donbass, and on the other, the Ukrainian and imperialist forces. Now, <clears throat> don't be fooled by what certain forces in this country are telling you. I can tell you with absolute certainty that the people of Donetsk, the people of Donbass, support Russian troops. They support them for a very, very good reason. Now, we've heard these cries of Russian troops out coming even from those that um, consider themselves on the left in Britain. The anti-war movement is saying that Russian troops are out. And we always say Russian troops out of where? And we know what would happen if Russian troops left Donbass, if they were withdraw. And if you want an idea of what would happen, look at what's happening in Gaza right now. This is what will happen. And the people of Donbass, the people of Donetsk, know that what faces them is a genocide because they've witnessed it every day for nine years. The dehumanising of them, the description of them as orcs, the banning of their language, their culture, their tradition, their books, their composers are now banned. Statues being torn down across uh, Ukraine. Now, contrast this, by the way, in Donetsk. I made a short film about this, about the stat some of the statues in, in Donetsk. But in the centre, well, obviously we saw Lenin at the centre, and Boris um, told me a very interesting story about the, how the communists defended Lenin from being torn down, the statue of Lenin from being torn down by Svoboda, um, by the Azov who came into the square and tied a rope around Lenin, tied it to a car and tried to tear it down and pull it down. And Boris mobilised uh, the communists to defend the square, to defend Lenin, to defend communism, just as they're defending uh, Donetsk. <laughs> but in Donetsk, in the centre, you have at one end of, uh, in the centre, a very nice uh, uh, boulevard, Pushkin Boulevard. But you have a statue of Pushkin, the famous Russian poet, the famous Russian author, the founder of the modern Russian language, and a national icon of Russia. Now you can walk down Pushkin Boulevard from one end and to the other, and you reach the other end of the boulevard, and there you see a statue of Taras Shevchenko, who is the Ukrainian national poet and a symbol of Ukrainian national identity. But unlike in the West, where statues like Pushkin's um, and Dostoevsky's, uh, Chekhov's are being pulled down, the statue of Taras Shevchenko remains untouched. And that tells you there is no hatred of the Ukrainian people. And I think that the people of Donetsk and Donbass are very clear about, um, about that. Now, I'm not going to give you a, a history lesson, but I think there's some important uh, background to know, really, about the deep connections between Donetsk and Britain. Donetsk was founded by a Welshman, a Welsh engineer called John Hughes, and he won uh, a tender to plate the harbour at Kronstadt, his uh, Millwall Ironworks company. But in order to do that, he needed two things. He needed material and he needed manpower. Now, the material for that came from Donetsk, where he founded the metallurgical factories and the mines that uh, really make up the area. So the very first people, the very, very first migrants to Donetsk were from Merthyr Tydfil. They were miners from Merthyr Tydfil. Now, these people, Donetsk was named Yuzovka in, in his, in his honour. It changed its name many times. It was called Stalino, Stalin. There is a rumour it was named Trotsky very briefly, but there's, there's no evidence to support that, and nobody really talks about it, perhaps, uh, <laughs> perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, but these are the very people, the foundation of Donetsk, but also Lenin, the great man himself, described 
uh, the Donbass as the beating heart of the Russian Revolution. And it was these people, it was these people, the revolutionary people of Donetsk, that powered the Russian Revolution, that sustained the Russian Revolution. And it's those very people that started, that kick-started uh, that movement there. The same people that vanquished the region from Nazi occupiers in 1943, in September 1943. A people's movement. A people's movement that fought against those Nazis. It's the same people now that are fighting against the neo-Nazis of the Azov, the proxy fighters of the imperialist forces today. Those people on the front line. The people on the front line. Yes, there are now Russian soldiers after the special military operation. But it was the people's militias that were set up, consisting of nurses, of shop workers, of miners and of teachers. They are the people that are now fighting the neo-Nazis. And it is because of this, it is because of this that we know that the imperialist forces are doomed to defeat. Now I made, comrades, the analogy with Palestine uh, earlier and I just want to tell you about one particular incident. And we can see a lot of similarities, there are some differences. But if you'll recall the, uh, the attack, the destruction by Israel of a hospital in Gaza very recently. And we saw how the media then started casting the seeds of doubt and saying, well, maybe, maybe it was Hamas that did it. Maybe it was a Hamas misfiring rocket. Anybody that knows anything about this kind of thing will know that Hamas does not have anything with the capability to destroy um, a hospital. Now, I saw the exact same thing in Donetsk. It was uh, around 10 o'clock in the evening, we heard an almighty explosion, louder than the type that we normally hear, so we knew something serious had happened. And in a, a, a town just, just outside of Donetsk called Makievka, it's a, a strong uh, mining, uh, mining town. And a hospital had been struck. I went to the scene uh, with my crew. We drove there. And the scene was, as you'd uh, expect, one of absolute chaos. Uh, the hospital had been very, very badly damaged. Uh, the windows had all been blown out. So there was some structural damage inside. People were trying to keep things going uh, because this was the place where people come for emergency uh, treatment. And I spoke to a number of the medical staff there. I spoke to some cleaners, people that had been hiding in the basement. We spoke to members of the local community who were, uh, I mean, sadly, they're used to their, uh, their community being shelled. I mean, if you drive around, and we did, and we looked, and there's, uh, the roofs of most of the apartment blocks have got holes in them. There's buildings that have been incredibly badly damaged and destroyed. Now, this was a standard thing, really, for me. I turn up at Shellings. I can go to one every single day and report on it. And this time I turned up. We made a, a short film for the news um, about the, this hospital being, being attacked. I did a short piece then for social media. I posted it on Twitter. Um, we drove back, and I'd had an incredible response. Thousands of people commenting. And they started out saying, this didn't happen. The hospital was not attacked. This is uh, Kremlin propaganda. Um, you know, this is, this, you're making it up. This didn't happen. Look outside. You can just see there's a few broken windows. And then I added the rest of the footage to, to the tweet and said, well, here's the inside of the building. Uh, this, you, can see the, you can see the damage. And we'd spoken to a health worker whose home had been destroyed. But then they started, then they changed once they realised, well, the hospital was struck. They said, well, actually what happened was the um, Ukrainian forces struck a Russian um, ammo dump, which was nearby, and it was in a disused block of, uh, block of flats, and they cooked, which means that, you know, that they'd been struck, and then all of a sudden all of these artillery shells and missiles then uh, flew off, and it was that that created the damage. And again, this was a lie. <laughs> You know, we have to you know, tell it like it is. I was there. And these people that were sitting you know, behind a computer in London or 
uh, or America or in, you know, somewhere in Europe, the, the NAFO crowd, um, the anti-Semitic troll farm. Obviously, the, they thought that they knew better than the people that live in Makievka, the people whose homes had been destroyed, the health workers that I spoke to, and, and myself, who was on the ground. Now, you know, I, I counted it and said, well, this is impossible because that very street that you're showing this map of, I drove down. I drove down that very street, and there was no military presence there. There were no military roadblocks. Um, there, was, there was nothing to suggest that, the, that what you're saying actually happened, because you would expect to see the remnants of the artillery shells. There was nothing like that at all. And also, nobody in the local community was complaining about Russia hiding arms there, which you would expect at least one person to, to kind of to, to break ranks. Um, so we, we kind of see that this is the imperialist playbook, and they will try. They, they will use the media uh, as a. You know, they, ironically, they talk about Russian propaganda when the biggest propaganda machine uh, we're seeing, with, you know, with the BBC, with CNN, with Channel Four, with the Times, the Telegraph, the Mail, um, uh, and everything that they have uh, at their disposal. So there's a reason why they do this. There's a reason why. Um, Russian media is, is banned, is blocked, and, and it's very, very clear because um, th there are war crimes and atrocities being committed in Donbass every single day. I see it every single day. I see health workers being killed. In Gorlovka, I attended, um, I attended um, the shelling of a fire station in which a firefighter was killed. Emergency services, I got caught up in one of these. We went to a shelling and um, what, what quite often happens is when you turn up at these places, when you turn up at the health centres or the fire, uh, fire stations, what they'll do is they'll wait a while until the emergency services arrive on the scene and then they'll attack again to cause maximum damage, but targeting those health workers. And one of them... Uh, in, back in May, um, was killed whilst she was uh, on her way to work. She was in the Petrovsky district, which is one of the, uh, the districts uh, just outside um, Donetsk. It's one of the outer districts. It's one of those that comes under frequent daily shelling. And she was driving on her way to work to th their local hospital, and there was a shelling of a um, bus stop. And this is another frequent thing. You, 13 people killed in, a, in a she the shelling of a bus stop. She stopped to administer emergency care to, uh, to, to those that were wounded. And just minutes later, there was another shelling and she was killed instantly. Now, if this kind of thing, if the attacks on uh, fire stations, if the killing of nurses and health workers, there was a health worker killed just last week, a few days ago, a health worker, three journalists from Izvestia were wounded. But if these incidents that, that have now become part of everyday life there, if they happened in Lvov or they happened in Kiev or any other city in western Ukraine, they would be front page news in every single newspaper. They would be broadcasts on BBC, on Channel 4, on ITV, um, calling for Vladimir Putin to be charged uh, with war crimes. So we see how, um, how, this, how this works. And people probably don't know about the cluster munitions that are being fired into civilian areas. Now this, again, just days after the United States announced that it was sending cluster munitions to Ukraine, they were already there, right? Let's be, let's be clear about that too. Those cluster munitions were already there. The United States just announced that they were going to authorise their use. I think on the Friday, um, Guterres, Antonio Guterres, said that... Um, the use of cluster munitions should be, or cluster munitions, he'd heard reports they were being used in civilian areas um, in, in Donetsk, in Donbass, which they were. And he said they should be consigned to the dustbin of history, which is all very well and good, but they did nothing about it. And just two days later, the first civilian victim um, since the announcement was claimed, a journalist for Ria Novosti uh, called Rosislav Zhurovlev. He was um, a communist, he was a, a, a comrade, and he was killed in the Zaporozhye region. Ironically, um, after he had been investigating with a, another group of journalists, 
the use of cluster munitions targeting civilian homes in that area. And as his, as his car left, um, it was deliberately targeted by Ukrainian forces. And uh, very sadly, he was killed. Now, this was denounced immediately by Maria Zaharova um, as a war crime. And uh, I actually wrote uh, a story about this, a news story. So I contacted the so-called press freedom groups and international journalist organizations asking them for comment and to condemn it. Now, um, I either I had a number of reactions, uh, generally silence, or we need to find out some more information before we comment. But the International Federation of Journalists, to their credit, issued a statement condemning the killing of a journalist and demanding a immediate and independent investigation into his killing. Now, this led to a response from the National Union of Journalists of Ukraine. And they issued a statement. They were quite angry about this. UNESCO, bizarrely, issued a statement, a similar statement to the IFJ, um, which I was quite surprised about. But the uh, uh, National Union of Journalists of Ukraine issued a statement celebrating uh, the, the demise of what they called a Kremlin propagandist and ruled out the fact that he was a journalist or that he should be treated as a civilian because, of course, targeting civilians is a war crime. But, of course, the, it was the journalist union um, cheering that on. So just a, a, a brief segue into this, to, to, just to talk very briefly about what happened at um, TUC Congress earlier this year with Motion uh, C-21 when the biggest trade unions in the country all fell in line behind perhaps the most reactionary motion that has been seen at that body for decades. And it called for essentially arming the Ukraine, arms to Ukraine. And when they say arms to Ukraine, they don't mean to the uh, revolutionary defenders of Donbass, <laughs> which we would love to see those weapons um, supplied uh, to, to the people that are defending the area. But of course, they meant the very bombs, the very missiles that are killing trade unionists and killing workers um, in Donetsk. Now, um, I think the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign, the so-called Ukraine Solidarity Campaign, a front for the Alliance for Workers' Liberty, has played a particularly pernicious role uh, in this. And they're lying. They're deceiving you. They're pretending that workers in Ukraine and left-wing organisations in Ukraine are supporting the call for more arms and more weapons, but they're not. The leftists, actually, in Ukraine, most of them, are in prison. Their organisations have been banned. The Communist Party of Ukraine was closed down and had all of its assets, its buildings, handed over to the state. Most of its members are in prison. It's been banned from standing in, in elections uh, for a very, very long time. We haven't heard a peep uh, about them from the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign, by the way. They're not interested in freeing actual leftists um, or standing up for workers. Every single news organisation, media organisation, uh, has been shut down as well. This is the democracy, the democratic values that we're supposed to be... Um, defending the burning alive of trade unionists in the Odessa Trade Union House, um, of which I've met some of them. I've met some of the survivors um, of that horrific, horrific tragedy. Um, but again, not a word about that. In fact, they follow the line that it was, it was the, um, it was the pro-Russians that did it, the Russian separatists that did it. They killed themselves and burnt themselves um, alive. So we see this they're also part of this kind of propaganda exercise. But the very trade unionists that they're claiming represent workers in, um, inside Ukraine are nothing of the sort. These workers, if you ever hear something about free trade unions, then alarm bells should already start uh, ringing. But one of the trade unions that they said was a representative of free uh, uh, mining union in Ukraine... Um, is in fact nothing more than an imperialist shill. He is somebody that handpicked a member of the Azov Battalion, the far-right neo-Nazis, to be his right-hand man in that union. He is somebody who organised at the height of the Maidan coup 
and he organised fake strikes, which were in reality bosses calling their workers and forcing them to stand outside their factories for one hour, and then they were filmed by Poroshenko's news channel and showed on a loop to say, look, this is the people going on strike. They are supporting the Maidan revolution, which, of course, they weren't. And worse than that, he said that the miners of Donbass are supporting the Maidan revolution. And they said, well, bring them. Bring them to the square then, which, of course, he couldn't. So he got his own workers to put on miners' hats and parade around pretending to be from Donbass. Now I can tell you again with absolute certainty that the miners of Donbass do not support the Maidan coup. <laughs> those, those trade unionists, I've been down the mines in, in Makievka, which I mentioned. I've been down that mine and I've seen the workers there and I've seen how production has fallen by a third. Why? Because one of the first things when the independent Ukraine was born after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mines turned into a racketeering um, business. And they filled in those mines, actually. They filled a lot of them with waters to stop them from producing, uh, producing coal. But production has fallen at the moment by something like a third. And the reason is because, one, those very mines are being shelled by Ukrainian forces. And two because the revolutionary miners, just as they did in 1943 when they fought against the fascists then, are now on the front line fighting to defend their homeland. So we know that this is not true. <coughs> another lie, another lie, is this case, fabricated case against Vladimir Putin about the I can't remember how many thousand it's supposed to be, 20,000 kidnapped children or something like this. I mean, this is absurd, and I think, you know, I, I haven't got time to go into the detail of that, but there's been some very good research conducted by the Grey Zone on this. They've, they've written about this um, being an absurdity and a fabrication. Um, but unlike the journalists that write about this in, in the West, there was a series in The Telegraph where they spoke to about three or four people and I read this article and the kidnapped children, and it amounted to this. This would have been the story had they bothered to report it properly without any um, sensationalism. Some children were invited to go to a summer camp in Crimea. Whilst they were in the summer camp, fighting intensified, so it wasn't really very safe for them to return home. So they stayed there. The kids, as teenagers are, as, you know, got bored <laughs> and wanted to go home, which they do. That's teenagers it's in every country anywhere in the world. But this amounted to, no, they're kidnapping our children. But the organisers said, well, they can go, but it's not safe. Their mother said, well, I want to bring them home. So she went and collected them. She collected them. They went home and they went often to live a new life in Kiev. And that was apparently evidence that Putin is kidnapping children. Now, I met scores and scores of these families that had been to these camps. I spoke to the children, I spoke to the parents, and what should have been actually a feel-good story about a Paralympian from Belarus organising holiday camps for disabled children, for people that are living under the daily shelling of their homes, of their schools. They, they can't go to school. There was an interesting thing talking about Kharkov having its first underground school being built. Well, great, but the kids of, uh, of, of Donetsk haven't been able to go to school for about eight or nine years because they're constantly attacked, shelled, and destroyed. So it was a relief from that. He organised the, the, the summer camps. Now, most of those children went there with their parents. All of them went there willingly. I met one of the, probably the happiest child I've seen in not just Donbass, but anywhere, uh, called Igor. And he loved it so much he wanted to go back. He was disappointed to, to have left uh, left this camp. And he came back and he'd had, what, what had happened there? Not, not this re-education, um, these re-education camps where they're being forced to learn Russian history and say Russia is great, Russia is wonderful, um, and all the rest of it. He'd had rehabilitation. He was told he would never walk. And he's come back now uh, and he's taking his first steps and he's very, uh, you know, very happy. So I met, I met these people and the story is nothing, nothing even close to what you're being told. 
But perhaps the biggest lie of all is about Mariupol. Mariupol, for many people in this country, um, evokes images of Russian atrocities, Russian war crimes. All sorts of horrors are supposed to have happened uh, in Mariupol. Now we're seeing the mercenaries, these two mercenaries, Aidan Aslin and Sean Pinner, who were captured in the steel plants in, in Mariupol as Russian troops advanced. They were captured. Pinner himself trained the Azov battalion members, the National Guard, whatever they call themselves, but he trained Azov for two years. This two-year period was when they were committing, probably at their peak, the war crimes and the atrocities that we're seeing. This is when they were... I mean, they terrorised the people of Mariupol for nine years, eight, nine years. But this is during the height of the atrocities, and they were shooting dead civilians. They were blowing up humanitarian aid centres. Many of them now are facing justice for their actions. You won't hear about this in Britain, I'm sure. In fact, the only thing that I saw about it was an article in the Daily Mail where they were lamenting the treatment of these people because they got shaved heads and they, oh, they look a little bit poorly. They don't look like they've been treated very well. Well, <laughs> they're treated a damn sight better than a lot of the Russian POWs, I can tell you that. And they're actually facing justice. They're facing a court hearing. They're facing trial. They're being held to account for what they did, these horrific crimes. And if you speak to the people of Mariupol, as I have, and I, and I speak to them, I've been to Mariupol countless times. I've been to the Azov-style steel plant. I've met the people that were held hostage and used as human shields in the Azov-style steel plants, as that Azov-style steel plant was mined. Now, there's one name, if you remember this name. When you go home, Google this name, Natalia... Uzmanova, and she was held in the basement. But when she came out, she told the world's press that were waiting for her what happened to her inside the catacombs of the Azov-style steel plant. But they carefully edited what she said. They chopped it, and they didn't include the part, and the full version is on YouTube. And perhaps maybe we could, maybe we could as a party, put it up, I might do something about that because I'm working on a, on a film about Mariupol and the Azov-style steel plant to try and change that narrative. But she, she explains very clearly what happened. And again, you can see how propaganda works because they cut off what she said. They cut off and they didn't want you to hear the truth. Now, I've spoken to countless people and I asked them how important it is for them to see justice meted out to these people for what they did in helping Mariupol to move on. And they all said it's very important, but I, even I was shocked when I asked uh, how, what that looked like. What does justice look like? And I just approached random people in the street, people sitting in a park, people with families, what you would describe as respectable people. Not like me. And I asked them, what, do, what does that look like? And I would say nine out of 12 people that we spoke to said they should be executed. And I was shocked, and perhaps I shouldn't have been, because they had to live with this every single day for nine years. I've been in the homes that have been destroyed. I've seen the children of the families that, were, that have lost fathers and lost their families because uh, of what happened there. Now, I don't want to go on too long. I've probably gone way over my uh, allotted, allotted time. And there's so much that I can tell you. I can tell you about the elections that were held there very recently. Free, fair, transparent elections that Ukraine tried to stop from happening. Uh, that they bombed the, the polling station that, that I was in. That people are shot at. Every, I've been shot at a few times now. You kind of get used to it, really. But um, just before I left, we were, uh, had a mortar round fired at us. And journalists should never make themselves... I, I always think that journalists should never make themselves the centre of um, a story because our role and my role is uh, to give a voice to the voiceless, a voice to the people of Donbass, a voice to those that are silenced by the West because you don't hear anything here about what's happening 
um, in, in, in Donbass. And, and the propaganda is effective because when I show people you know, the, 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 the attacks on passenger buses, the blowing up of cars, the babushka's homes that have been destroyed. And great, and I, I actually heard another, and I went to a, a block, of, an apartment block that had been destroyed by, um, I went to, oh, I've been to many that have been destroyed by cluster munitions, but this one by an artillery shell. And I was told this didn't happen, that this was fake, that these were actors. So I said, okay, so you want to believe that. What you want us to believe is that a group of, you know, two 80-year-old elderly women managed to make a hole in the roof of their house. Right? They managed to mess up and destroy a bit of their kitchen, cover it in dust. Then they made a hole again in the floor of that kitchen and they'd worked out the exact trajectory that that artillery shell had taken. They happened to have a partly destroyed artillery shell and they put it in the ground and made a kind of an impact crater. And then they also got the entire of their apartment block to lie about it, join in the lie, and they managed to recreate the exact sound that an artillery shell makes as it, as it crashes through a building on the off chance that Steve Sweeney might hear it <laughs> and turn up and, and do a report for a news channel that realistically nobody watches because we're banned. Right? That's, that's what they'd rather have you... Um, have you, have you believed? So I've been in the steelworks, I've been in the, uh, the maternity hospital, I've been in the drama theatre in, in Mariupol, I've spoken to the people that were held hostage there, I've seen the shellings, I've witnessed every single day the bombing of civilian areas, the cluster munitions that are killing people, the cluster munitions that have destroyed a university building, and we see all that, and then we see the TUC passing these reactionary motions that are you know, that, that, that really are calling for the more killing, more death, and that's where, kind of where we are. So just to finish, I'll just finish with a few quick things, is that Boris, um, when, when I met Boris the last time, we were talking about, we did a short film about the Donetsk Declaration. This is quite an important um, declaration. It was a statement drawn together by communist and workers parties in both Russia uh, and in Ukraine and it characterizes correctly the situation as a defensive war it describes it as a just liberation struggle a struggle for self-determination a struggle against imperialism and its neo-nazi proxies and their right to describe it in those terms now I'm very proud that one of the first parties, in fact, the first party, that agreed to sign up to the Donetsk Declaration uh, internationally was the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist. I'm very proud. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to be a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist a serious organisation, serious comrades, and I congratulate the party for putting on today's important event, celebrating the Russian Revolution. And I'll just finish. I could go on and on and on, <laughs> but I can see... <laughs> Hurry up. I'm hurrying up. I'm hurrying up. So I'll finish, and I'll stay around afterwards and probably talk a little bit more if anybody wants to find out practical actions and things that we can do. We're making films, we're getting stuff out to trade unions about teachers having their legs blown off. I'm doing a film for the N NEU about this to try and counter the, the lies of the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. So there's a lot of things that, 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 we can, uh, that we can do, but I'll finish just by saying victory to revolutionary Donbass, victory to the Palestinian resistance, and victory to communism. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. There was a very famous editor, wasn't there, of the New York Times who said that uh, uh, 
about his own profession, about journalists, that they were all the prostitutes of very rich men. Steve's the exception to that rule. <laughs> uh, but, it, but, it, <laughs> but it lets you understand, you know, that um, the more imperialism becomes a decadent and parasitic force, the more it realizes the value of propaganda to brainwash the working class, to keep them as its wage slaves, the more at odds our mainstream presses with reality. But we feel like we've watched it, we feel like we've seen it, we feel the pictures that's presented to us on our screens explain to us the reality of what's happened. You know, the Nazis famously said, the Goebbels said, the truth is the enemy of the lie. And by extension, the truth is the enemy of the state. When your state is exploitative, when it's built on the opposite of the interests of the vast mass of the world, but you have to constantly say that you're upholding human rights, decency, democracy, and all these sweet-sounding phrases. We, why do we fight the Afghanistan war? Girls' education. We're very interested in girls' education, so we had to destroy Afghanistan for a 20-year period for $3 trillion. So, you know, the, we say this because, you know, Lenin said, the bourgeois press, the bourgeois papers, the bourgeois media are supported by large funds of capital. Their authority, their ability to reach the world rests upon the money they have. Workers, too, must support their organizations with their own money, with their own time, with their own efforts. Many of you are members of our party. Some of you are not. I want to invite those of you are not to think very seriously about joining us. Please, it's easy to do so. Go to our website, thecommunists.org. Go to action. Go to join. Join up. Become a supporter. Study. We offer, first and foremost, not the gun to rush into the street and start creating chaos, but the book to start understanding the world, that you can spread that understanding to the mass of your class. We understand clearly it's mass action of the working class that is going to bring fundamental change, and it's possible even in this country. So please join up with us. In the meantime, I want you to reach into your pockets, please, and pull out some form of money. I know we all carry you know, uh, uh, money on, on cards these days. And later on, we'll have people circulate. If you want to make a contribution, you can before you leave. But in the meantime, please, if I ask Ellie, if I ask Josh, if I ask Mike, if I ask Dan, perhaps, to go among you and make a small um, uh, a collection for our work, we do need urgently to push our work forward. As Mao said, everything under, under heaven is in chaos. The situation is excellent. You know, we are living through difficult times, but times of great opportunity. Now is the time to redouble our efforts. So please reach into your, into your pocket, put that money there. That money will be spent to further the finest cause in all the world, the cause of the liberation of mankind. We need your money. Most importantly of all, we need you. We need your organization. We need your efforts. We need your contacts. We need your prestige and influence amongst the working class. You are an influential group of people. So people are going to come through. Please give generously. You can give more online. But most of all, we want your time. We want your contribution towards building the organization. And when you've given enough, when we judge that you've given enough, we're going to give the last contribution of the meeting, which will be Jyoti's uh, uh, contribution. So we'll give that, give that now, and then Jyoti will speak. Thank you, comrades. We're going to get on with the last contribution now, the fin final contribution, which will be of our, our vice chair, Jyoti Bra. Jyoti, as you know, has um, been doing a fantastic job with the World Anti-Imperialist Platform, as well as really getting our social media profile elevated. She does a huge amount. She edits our paper. She leads many of our contributions, and we've been very proud of the work that she's been doing to push forward uh, our, our work, our line, to help people understand uh, what, we are, what we are doing in the party and why they should join us, and really what the working class needs to do to liberate itself. So it's with real great pleasure I have introducing Jyoti. I know you've come a long way to see her, so please put your hands together and welcome her.
very much, comrades. I promise you, this is the shortest speech of the night. So uh, feel free to sit down and just chill out for five minutes. I'm here really just to sum up. On behalf of the party, bring together what we've he heard here today in so many different ways from so many fantastic and inspiring speakers. I hope that you have enjoyed listening to them as much as we have, that you have learned from every one of them, their different approaches, their different experiences, their different perspectives on the importance, the significance of October. And I just want to sum something up about October for you. You know this, you know this, but you have to always bear it in mind. It's easy to forget in the day-to-day in the -day cut and thrust of life, the hurly-burly of just trying to survive. It's easy to forget these things. October changed the world forever. Forever. It wasn't a blip. It wasn't a thing that happened that day a long time ago. It was the beginning of a process which is still underway. It opened a new historical era. We always have to remember that. We live in the era that October began. Never forget it. Never imagine that our movement is just this few people sitting here and the rest of the world doesn't care. Whether they know it or not, we have the key to the future of humanity. Don't forget it. You know, October disproved imperialist propaganda about the subject races, about how the colonized peoples, the black people, the brown people, were inherently backward, would never be able to rule themselves. It disproved it forever, categorically. Now, the imperialists have to talk about anti-racism and equality. Why? Because of October. October disproved class society propaganda about women's inherent inferiority. They used to tell us in this country until quite recently that women just have littler brains, littler bodies, they're a bit weak and a bit useless, they're only fitted for raising children and taking care of their husbands and cooking the dinner and doing the laundry. It was Soviet example that disproved that decisively, conclusively and forever. It was the Soviet Union that proved that people of different nationalities really can live together and work together in harmony, in cooperation, for the benefit of all. It was the Soviet Union that proved decisively that workers really can do without capitalists. And it proved, we've heard from some of our speakers earlier about the problems we face in our society and about how imperialist propaganda tries to tell us that, oh, well, yes, it's really bad, isn't it? But what can you do? Well, it was the Soviet Union which proved that you can do something, that the needs of the masses really can be taken care of. And the fact that we have and have had Healthcare, education, housing, even things like legal aid and cultural access for the masses in Britain and other imperialist countries, they were all the result of workers' demands to be allowed to follow the Soviet example. They were not the result of kindness or benevolence of our rulers. They are not the reflection of British or Western civilised values. These are socialist values, comrades. <laughs> This, this is a message we have to take to people. Everything we have that's worth having is a reflection of socialist values and socialist humanity. And the other thing I wanted to highlight to you today is that October founded a movement in its image. It showed us the need for the Bolshevization of our movement. What does that mean? It means building parties of the type that Lenin built the type that can actually organize the working class. You know, most of the parties that made up the Communist International in the beginning of its founding were small and they were new. Some of them were splinters from existing old big parties which had become totally rotten in the peaceful period before World War I and had been exposed during the course of that terrible war. These parties emerged in a period of crisis 
and revolutionary turmoil. They grew quickly because they worked together and followed a strongly unified and scientific line. Of course, they were helped to grow by the example of the USSR. During the time of Stalin, the Soviet Union faced and overcome every kind of difficulty. Its prestige grew and grew and grew. With Stalin and the Bolsheviks at their head, the movement was strong everywhere. It attracted the best and the brightest, and not only from the working class, but from every class, especially the young. Even from the bourgeois class, young people joined the communist movement in that time because they saw the advance of the capitalist system. They saw the decay, the crisis, the drive to war and fascism of dying imperialism. And they wanted to be on the side of progressive humanity. This is what a real movement does for people. This is how it inspires people. It's another message we need to take to heart. It's not the size of an organization or its age that determines its usefulness to the working class. It's the line it follows. It's the message it brings to the working class. And it's the nature of the international bonds that it forges. And just on this last point, I'd like to underline, you know, the litmus test today for cooperation and joint work that we are now engaging in so fruitfully, whether it's at home or abroad, is the attitude an individual or an organization takes to the imperialist drive to war, and especially in the fronts in Ukraine, in Palestine, in the Sahel, in Korea, and in Taiwan. And when we look at this war drive, these are the messages we are taking to the working class comrades. Russia and China are not our enemy. They are the cornerstones of today's growing anti-imperialist resistance movement. <laughs> the war drive of the imperialists has nothing to do with defending freedom and democracy. It has everything to do with trying to escape the deepest ever crisis of overproduction, a crisis that will never be overcome until we defeat imperialism. So our role in Britain is to oppose the war drive and expose the media lies that accompany it. We have to help people understand the only true way out of this, cr this crisis, this downward spiral into ever greater poverty, ever more war, a spiral towards fascism, total war, total immiseration of the masses of the world's population, and there's no way out that the imperialists can find. Our demands in this situation of the drive to war are for a mass movement of non-cooperation with every aspect of the NATO and Zionist war machines, whether it's making and transporting munitions and troops, whether it's logistical support, whether it's creating, printing or broadcasting, as Steve's pointed out, pro-war propaganda, which is in itself a war crime. Here's a case in point. Here's a case in point. Where were the print and media unions when the most recent deluge of lies about massacred babies was being unleashed on the British public? Why were print workers printing those headlines? Why were supermarket workers putting them out on the shelves? Where were their unions in organizing their refusal to cooperate with this deluge of hideous and disgusting propaganda against the Palestinian resistance. Where are the transport unions refusing to transport British weapons towards Ukraine and towards Palestine? These things can be achieved, comrades, and they must be achieved. We must consistently, persistently, without stopping, ceaselessly, take these messages into the working class movement. A growing awareness of the need for this is there. We must harness the energy of everybody who's starting to understand this and bring them together in a movement that the trade unions can no longer ignore. <laughs> we 
We must follow the example of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. We have chosen a side in this war, and we must not be intimidated from putting forward our views clearly to as many people as we can reach. And that is why, comrades, we also call for the victory of the resistance forces in all these wars, because only through their victory can their peoples be free of the endless threats of imperialism. Only by defeating imperialist aggression all along the line can we advance once again on the road towards socialism, on the road of October. And that is why, comrades, our slogan in the wars is not ceasefire now, but victory to the resistance. Can I ask you all to stay standing? We're going to just sing two beautiful anthems of the working class. One, the first one, is we, I think we have the words. Can you see the words projected? I think we'll see them as we go. So this is the anthem of the USSR, sung by Paul Robeson. It's a beautiful song. If you don't know the words, that's OK. You'll pick up the tune as you go, and the words are printed there. Let's go.
Ne never forget, never forget the DCL coder. Um, that's beautiful. And now, of course, um, we celebrate the Soviet Union precisely because it was a land of internationalism. It was our country. When we sing their national anthem, we're singing a workers' anthem. And Stalin always pointed out that to stand and defend with the Soviet Union was to defend the workers of all countries. And similarly, if the Soviet Union were to fall, an era of the blackest reaction would set in, would seize the positions of the workers and democracies by the throat. And are we not living through that time? So now is the perfect time then to say, to sing our final anthem. And with this, we'll close the meeting, though I hope some of you will be able to stay around and talk to us. Of course, the anthem of the international proletariat the international, so please come and join us in singing. Yeah.